Thank you very much. It's an enormous pleasure to be here and to spend some time with Big, who uh, I've known since my time at Imperial College. Um, I work for a company called Semiconductor Devices in Israel, and our main product is uh, infrared cameras for night vision, for medical applications, for they're used in architecture as well to look for hot spots. But the basic idea is they can see uh, in wavelengths that our eyes cannot see, and they can measure very small uh, temperature changes in an image. So I'll start by uh, describing uh, one of our latest detectors, which is based on a super lattice, very similar to the kind of super lattices being grown in the MBE uh, in Zbigs group. And then uh, I'll go on to talk about a kind of intellectual curiosity that uh, belongs to materials of this type. I don't think it's going to lead to any products in my company in the next five years, maybe even 50 years, but nevertheless, it's, it's a fascinating uh, piece of physics, and it certainly does have applications in things like quantum computing and the sort of things going on here. So uh, the, the diagram on the right is actually taken from the Nobel Prize website uh, and describes uh, in a pictorial form why they gave the prize last year to three, Briti to, to three American scientists who all actually began their careers in Britain and then drained their brains to America. Uh, and they, they uh, developed a lot of very sophisticated uh, theoretical uh, uh, tools for uh, describing the properties of solids at very low temperatures, where when you go below the solid phase, uh, uh, spins or other uh, properties of the, uh, of, of the quasi-particles tend to uh, uh, collaborate into some macroscopic order or vortex uh, and this will kind of show up in the later part of my talk, which, because most of these properties are described as topological. Uh, but the first part of the talk will stick with the solid phase, uh, which is appropriate to uh, semiconductor devices. And I'll begin by uh, giving a little background on semiconductor band symmetries, which are important for both parts of the talk, and uh, some of the uh, sources of noise in uh, PN diodes. Uh, I'll then describe a new a kind of new device called a barrier device based on this material system, uh, indium arsenide, gallium antimonide, uh, aluminium antimonide. I'll go on to say how we uh, simulate the, the quantum efficiency in the dark current and then show a little bit about what kind of performance you can achieve today. I'll then move on to the topological phase of the talk and describe, introduce another material which is a very close relative which has a super lattice based on mercury telluride, cadmium telluride, uh, and uh, describe the relationship between the two, because the, the, the first material is kind of easier to understand than the second, and it's the more widely studied of the two in these topological materials. Uh, and then uh, talk about the phase transition itself, then talk about edge states, which are uh, one of the most interesting uh, curiosities of this, these materials. Uh, and then, uh, if there's time, talk a little bit about some work I've been doing recently on uh, what happens when the samples get narrower. So this is, uh, first of all, the super lattice detectors. This is a picture of the transmission of the atmosphere. Uh, the jargon is short wave infrared, mid wave infrared, and long wave infrared. My company makes detectors which work in all of these ranges. But today, I'll focus on the long wave infrared, and particularly a detector that works with a, wave, a cutoff wavelength of around 9.5 micron, which is very close to the peak of the Planck distribution. We're all giving off photons because we're at room temperature, and the peak of the Planck distribution is at 10 microns. So if you want to make an infrared detector which is uh, mo most sensitive, you choose to work in the long wave. The, the, the downside is that the energies of these photons are around a tenth of an electron volt. So you have quite big technological challenges to avoid leakage currents and, and other problems because the energies are so small. So that's what we're going to talk about. So first of all, a little bit about uh, how the band structure of all these uh, cubic materials uh, uh, is, uh, arises. Uh, I've, I've shown here that we could be talking about gallium timonide or, or cadmium telluride. Gallium timonide is a uh, group three gallium and uh, t uh, group five tellurium. Cadmium telluride is group uh, uh, two uh, and tellurium group six, but the, the, the point is they all add up to eight. Uh, you could talk about silicon and germanium as well. But the idea is if you have a, a molecular unit of two atoms, 
uh, on average, they have four electrons and they sit on the, S and the, the valence S and P orbitals. So when you join two atoms together, you end up with bonding and antibonding orbitals and all the eight electrons fall on the bonding orbitals and there's a gap before the antibonding S and P orbitals. So when you now form a band structure, you end up with a broadening of these uh, atomic levels into bands and the, the lowest uh, or, the, or the highest filled band, or the, which we call the valence band, is therefore based on P symmetry orbitals and the lowest empty band, which is the conduction band, is based on S symmetry orbitals. That's very important throughout this talk. So just to visualize how these uh, wave functions might look, if you look at a, uh, an elect this has jumped, this arrow has jumped a bit, but if we were looking at a, a state somewhere around here, so somewhere into the valence band, uh, the, uh, the, uh, a PZ state would look something like this. You'd have a PZ orbital, but because of the, the, the we make, that, that's the periodic part of the wave function, then there's a wave part that makes up the whole Bloch function, and the wave part would be ch causing the phase to change every half wavelength. So you'd have an orbital with plus here and minus here, it would switch to a minus on top and plus below, and that's some, what the PZ wave function would look like, and you can imagine what the PX and the PY would look like. Similarly, here's an S uh, w uh, symmetry wave function where we have spherical orbitals which change phase along the wave direction. So we're talking about S and P symmetry bands. So the next thing is we, we take a semiconductor with a band gap and we uh, join an N-type semiconductor to a P-type semiconductor, we apply a bias, we get a depletion layer here with L depletion, we have a flat band region called LP uh, in this case, even though it's N-type, we call it LP because the minority carriers are holes and it's the holes which will have to diffuse to this uh, junction to be collected. So if, uh, if, if, because it's at, uh, above absolute zero, heat will create an uh, uh, electron and hole pairs uh, at a certain rate and the, these holes will then diffuse to the depletion region where they're collected. And that's called a diffusion process. And because this, uh, this, thick, this layer has to be quite wide in order to absorb all the light, let's say, coming from the right, uh, this diffusion process, you would think, would give quite a large contribution to the noise. It would be a current that's there even when no light is arriving. But there's another process called a generation recombination process that occurs through shockley reed hall traps and if you read the textbooks, they all describe how the traps in the middle of the gap are the ones that do most of the, uh, the work uh, or, or the ones that give you the most problems because then an electron can jump from the valence band to a trap uh, with half the band gap energy and another half band gap will take it to the conduction band. So uh, it's the smallest energy where you can make two of these jumps. Uh, moreover, because once you've made an electron that sits on this trap, the hole is immediately driven out by the field, so it can't go back. So this whole process, and, uh, and, this whole, and uh, as soon as the electron jumps the conduction band, it's, it's swept out to the right by the field, so it can't go back. So this generation recombination process is very efficient, even though there might be only parts per billion of these traps. These traps are basically imperfections in the crystal, which are usually there you almost always below parts per million, usually in the, uh, the, the tens of to parts per billion. But because of this, uh, this mechanism, it acts like a pump. Uh, it go, it, the, the field drives it in one direction, and in uh, uh, all the three, five materials, this is the most dominant process to the dark current, and this is called the generation recombination current. So we can add up the two contributions to the current, the, 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 uh, this is a 1 over T versus log I plot at low temperatures, which are on the right. We have a smaller slope corresponding to half the energy, uh, which is exponentially the exponential activation energy. And then at some point, the diffusion uh, current takes over because it has a steeper slope uh, with a full band gap energy. And we add them up to give us the whole current. And most infrared detectors made from 3, 5 materials sit here where the dark current is dominated by the GR process. And if you could get rid of it, you'd be able to move to the left and raise the operating temperature. So that's what we did a few years ago. We came up with a device which is shown on the right. But first of all, uh, just a few words of what's shown on the left. Uh, I'm going to give an example here based on these, these super lattices. Indium arsenide, gallium antimonide for the uh, photon absorbing layer indium arsenide, aluminium antimonide for, the, for, for a barrier layer, and then again, indium arsenide, gallium antimonide for a contact layer. We call this device a PBP device, P because the photon absorbing layer is P-type, B because there's a barrier, 
and then P again for the contact. So what this shows is the P, uh, the profile of the, the P symmetry valence band. Uh, in the absorber layer, you can see a mini, uh, a mini band here, a bit like the chronic, you could uh, think of it as a chronic penny-like mini band. There's another one here uh, near the valence band of the, of the uh, barrier layer. Uh, there's a wider one f uh, f f in, the, in the conduction band profile f for the photon absorbing layer and another narrower one in the conduction profile of the barrier layer. And we designed these materials by choosing the layer widths so that the uh, edges of these conduction, these, these S-like conduction bands and P-like valence bands give us this profile. It's a, a straight line in the conduction band and it's a barrier in the valence band. And uh, uh, if you forget now about the bulk band profiles and you just think about these black lines, when we then dope the, 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 the structure P-type in all the layers, and you put a bias on it, you get a profile for the band edges that looks rather like this. Now, uh, how does that help you? Well, in the photon absorbing layer, there's no electric field, so uh, you get this diffusion process where, where, where the, the, uh, uh, the, ge the generation recombination centers don't uh, drive the, the, the dark current like they do in a depletion layer. So this, the current in the photon absorbing layer is activated by the full band gap. But, in the, uh, but the barrier here is fully depleted. You can see there's an electric field in it. It's a kind of strange uh, hump here. But if you swan Poisson's equation for a background charge of negatively charged ionized acceptors, you'd see it would give a, ba a, a band which would curve in this direction. And, and you bias it so that when uh, a minority electron is created, it can get over this hump and get to the contact layer. But you don't want to have depletion here. The moment you have depletion here, you'll start this generation recombination process, which will give you a much higher dark current. So you keep the, the bands flat here. There is generation recombination in this depleted barrier layer, but half the band gap here is enormous. So uh, its activation energy is still bigger than the activation energy of the current in the absorbing layer. So uh, it's essentially negligible. And so you've actually driven away all the GR current, and you only get this diffusion current. And so it drives the dark current of the device down by one or two orders of magnitude. I'll show you uh, some measurements in a moment. So we, we've patented uh, a whole uh, zoo of these detectors made from different materials since 2003, when the, we had the original idea, uh, up to uh, some of our latest ones in 2015. So uh, how does this... Uh, Let's go backwards a bit. How does this work when you shine light on it? It's, it's a kind of curious animal because it's totally unipolar. It's not like a PN junction. You learn that devices have to have N-doping and P-doping. This only has P-doping. Nevertheless, you can bias it, uh, and the battery actually forms a part of the... Sorry. The battery actually forms a part of the device. Uh, the battery maintains the chemical potential on the two contacts. So when light comes along, it creates an electron hole pair, and the electron can get across to the contact, just like in a normal PN diode. But you're left with, an, uh, with, with a hole, which is uh, an extra charge from what you had originally. But the battery says, no, I'm maintaining the chemical potential. So uh, first of all, and also there's an electron which arrived in the contact. So the battery basically bal balances the chemical potential in the contact layer. Now there's an electron on the hole, so it's neutralized the charge. It takes out the electron from the absorbing layer because it has to balance the chemical potential there. And as it does so, it goes through the, the, the measuring circuit and registers a signal. And then finally, the electron and hole in the contact recombine. And so one photon gives you one uh, electron passing through your measuring circuit. So it's a kind of strange device. For a long time, people call these photoconductive, but they're not because a photoconductor uh, can often give you signal with uh, uh, a gain, photoconductive gain, which may be a thousand. Whereas here you get one electron passing through your circuit for one photon. So that's more like a photovoltaic device. So they're a kind of hybrid between photoconductive and photovoltaic. But if you look in Wikipedia, photovoltaic device is defined as one that gives you a voltage when you shine light on. This doesn't give you a significant voltage. It will give you a small one, but it's kind of parasitic. 
uh, but it doesn't give you a, a voltage the same way a PN junction would, but a photovoltaic device does give you one, uh, one electron uh, through your circuit for one photon. So this is, to my mind, much more like a photovoltaic than a photoconductor. So here's an example. When you make one of these devices and bias it to operation, uh, and you compare it with a diode, these were two devices we made with a, 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 the same absorbing layer, uh, you can see that in the uh, PBP case, we've completely cancelled out this GR current. So we've moved from this red dot through to this blue dot. Whereas in the PN junction, you still get these two slopes. And the difference in dark currents for this device, which has uh, a band gap of 0.1 EV, is about 20. So we've reduced the dark current noise by a factor of 20. When we go to larger band gaps, this effect is even bigger, and we can reduce the, the current by at least two orders of magnitude. So a little bit about how we fabricate a detector. Here's our Gen 200 MBE machine, which can grow up to seven three-inch wafers. We've recently purchased a second, so we have two Gen 200s and also a single Gen 3 for research purposes. This is a STM of one of our super lattices, showing how abrupt the interfaces are between the indium arsenide and gallium antimonide. Uh, once you get this wafer, you, that you process it into mesas, uh, which are etched, uh, rectangle uh, edge squares which isolate the individual devices. You, you put on an indium bump. Uh, you then uh, get a silicon readout integrated circuit, which we design in-house. We have our own VLSI engineers who design these to, to uh, have the correct signal, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sig signal um, processing for, for, for the, the size of signal that comes from the device. Uh, uh, and we, we fuse the indium, indium bumps on the readout circuit with indium bumps on, these, uh, on our epitaxial uh, device. We inject the space with a, a hybridization uh, material. We then uh, polish off the substrate to leave a thickness of just a few microns. And then the light will come from the back. It will be absorbed. It will create a signal which will flow through to this readout circuit. So it gives you essentially 100% fill factor. We then, uh, take, we, we then dice these devices, put them on an on a, on a, uh, alumina carrier. We put an anti-reflection coating here, uh, which looks green in this case, in visible light. Uh, but it's designed for the infrared wavelength. And it goes inside one of these coolers. This is a Stirling cycle cooler with a cold finger that goes inside this small dewer. Uh, the cooler is made out by another Israeli company called Recor. The, the duo is made in-house, the electronics around the outside take the signal that comes from this readout circuit and convert it into a video signal and then send it to the, to the screen. And this is the coal shield. Everything, uh, the, the detector sits on this plane. In, I'm, in, I'm sorry, this is the field stop. Uh, and the detector sits inside a coal shield inside this field stop. There's a window on the top. The whole thing is under a huge vacuum that, that has to stay good for many years. So. Uh, we, we, in order to make one of these detectors, we've got to have a, a quite a good uh, ability to model uh, the, 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 the band structure. I showed you at the beginning how complicated it is with all these bands and how you've got to line everything up. So kind of a, for a kind of a hobby, which turned into a business, uh, started in uh, uh, the la la late part of the 2000s, I, I was uh, interested in, uh, actually got interested in a paper by two Russians, Takhtamirov and Volkov. I believe Takhtamirov was actually here at the Perimeter Institute for, for a while. Uh, but they, they came with a very nice, simple enough treatment I could understand uh, about how to include the interfaces in a K.P model uh, of narrow band gap uh, semiconductors, where it actually has a very significant effect on the result. So uh, uh, I came up with an with a a, a implementation of their theory for these cubic semiconductors. Uh, and then uh, I had a, a, a master's student who worked with me for two years who actually uh, wrote the computer uh, uh, algorithms for this. And we've, we managed to get extremely good uh, fits between the measured uh, data on our super lattices, which are grown in-house in green, and the model, which is shown as the blue dashed lines. And you can see it's working all the way from super lattices with uh, uh, 10 micron cutoff all the way through to 4.6. So, and we, had, we just have, again, one of the nice things about this method is we've, we've cut it down to seven parameters, which we fit once. And then we own, the only thing we put in is the layer thicknesses. Uh, and the, and, and uh, three of those parameters belong to the interface. 
So, so once we've got this absorption spectrum, I've put in here inhomogeneous broadening, which actually comes from the interface roughness. I don't have time to go into it, but we've, we can measure it from splittings in the photoluminescence lines. Uh, once we have an absorption spectrum, there's something called the uh, transfer matrix theory, which you'll find in many textbooks, or the optical transfer matrix theory, where you build a two by two matrix for each layer, which depends on the layer thickness and the complex refractive index. Well, all of these layers for the, for the device have real refractive indices except the absorber layer, uh, and that's very easy once you have the absorption spectrum to write down the complex refractive index. Uh, you multiply all of these matrices together to get the grand matrix, and the grand matrix you can, you can work out all the optical properties like the reflection or, the, in this case, the, the amount of light that's absorbed. So this is uh, finally a, a curve that we calculate. Uh, remember, we just started with the layer thicknesses and we calculate all the way through to what the, res the, the spectral response will be of the detector, uh, or how much, uh, how, what percentage of photons will actually uh, give a signal. So in this case, the peak is 60% quantum efficiency. Uh, we'll, we, we get uh, e 60, if we have 10 electrons coming in, we'll get six electrons in our, I'm sorry, 10 photons coming in, we'll have six electrons coming out in our signal. Uh, and this is the measured uh, response. I'm sorry it's a bit noisy because uh, uh, we, have, we didn't uh, evacuate the, uh, uh, the, the, the optical path well enough to remove some of the uh, rotation lines in the atmosphere, but you see the agreement is very good. Now, what about the dark current? Well, the dark current, once we've done the uh, calculation of the absorption spectrum, which is the hardest part, we then have the density of states for each band. And so we just put the density of states into the standard expressions for the electron and hole concentration, and out pops the intrinsic carrier concentration. So here's a plot of the intrinsic carrier concentration for a super lattice with a cutoff wavelength of 10.4 micron. That's a band gap of about 110 millivolts. This is the intrinsic concentration as a function of temperature. This is the formula for the diffusion current. It depends on the intrinsic concentration squared, the thickness of the active layer, the amount of majority doping, how much we dope it, and the, and the minority carrier lifetime. So this we know, the, the active layer thickness we know, NI I've just calculated here, I need to know the doping. We can measure it by, uh, by uh, measuring the capacitance as a function of voltage on the device. As we expand the depletion region through the device, we can actually work out how many uh, dopants are there, and this is a plot of the doping concentration as a function of thickness as we go away from the barrier. Um, I'm not allowed to actually put a scale on here to tell you what we dope, but it's, but it's understood. And then uh, we calculate the uh, dark current, and that's shown by this black line, uh, and I compare it with measurements. You see we get a very good fit. The only adjustable parameter is the lifetime, which turns out to be seven nanoseconds. And that sounds horribly short, but it's long enough to give you a, a good detector. But, but I give a... a um, uh, a, a challenge to as big as group and anybody involved in this field to find ways, if possible, to reduce the uh, or to increase this lifetime by varying the, the growth uh, conditions. Uh, I believe that it is somehow related to how you grow these super lattices uh, and, and, how, uh, and how many uh, GR centers end up, particularly in the gallium antimonide layer. But if we compare that, or although this sounds horribly short, this, this is taken to, as a moment as the current state of the art. It's called Rule 07. It came out in 2007. And you can see there were only about a factor of three above it. So these super lattices are getting uh, very, very close to state of the art. So just to show you, these are measurements, direct measurements of the lifetime in similar super lattices with a 10 micron cutoff from the US uh, Night Vision Directorate. Uh, and they actually came up with very similar numbers around the 10 nanosecond range. So uh, it could well be that there's a, a small geometrical factor in the k.p calculation. I wouldn't like to say that 7 nanoseconds is the most definitive number, but the ballpark is, is very good agreement with what's been measured. So just uh, an example of uh, performance here. here are, uh, uh, five different detectors. This is the dark current histogram of all the pixels in one of these focal plane arrays. Now we have uh, a third of a megapixel of 15 micron uh, pitch pixels. So each, I showed you, we had to etch measures to, to define the pixels in our array. So each uh, pixel is 15 micron across. We have a third, a third of a million of them. And this is a histogram of the dark current through all of those pixels. And you can see it's very, very sharp, sometimes with a full width at heart maximum of 5%. Uh, very symmetrical, no, no leakage tail to, uh, to the side. 
Uh, and, and the key to this, which I can't tell you too much about, is, is, is the passivation. We've actually, uh, you, one of the, it sounds all quite straightforward up to now, but, but, but once you etch these devices and expose surfaces, often they fail because of leakage through the surface. And for two years, we were totally stuck until we found a, a solution to the surface treatment, and then it suddenly all started to work. So the next, next graph is called the NETD. This is a noise equivalent temperature difference. If we, make, if we uh, uh, use this camera to, to, to film a scene at 30 hertz uh, frame rate uh, with an F number of 2.7, which is typical for, for, for cameras of this sort, uh, we get a histogram here with a peak at 13 millikelvin. That means that there are two points on your scene which are different by 13 millikelvin. You can actually distinguish, more than 13 millikelvin, you can actually distinguish them. So it shows how sensitive these detectors are in uh, measuring small temperature differences. And this is just a, an example of a scene five kilometers away when the, with the detector running at 77K uh, with F number of 2.7. So that concludes the first part of the talk. And now from the sublime to the ridiculous, I'm going to go on to something which is rather different. And that's to look at some of these vortex-like properties that actually belong to the same materials. These materials have been studied for something like uh, 20 years now. And, and until two, uh, for the first 10 years at least, nobody really knew about these effects, but they were there all the time. If you cool them uh, low enough and you design the layer thicknesses correctly, you actually start to see some rather strange vortex-like behavior. So this diagram will show up a bit later. So let's start on the right. This is uh, what I showed at the beginning, the band profile of the absorbing layer of our super lattice of indium arsenide and gallium antimonide. I had to change the colors a bit, not to confuse you with other states that will come up. Uh, which, uh, which I, I already used those colors for. But the conduction band is now orange, the valence band is green, and I have my mini Koenig penny like mini band in the, for, the, for the electrons, for the S-like electrons, and for the P-like holes. And the key here is that as, because of the, the, valence, the bulk valence band profile intersecting the conduction band profile uh, uh, by about 150 millivolts, when I make these layers wider, at some point the uh, ordering of the bands will switch and the conduction band will become uh, P-like and the valence band will become S-like. And the same thing happens in this uh, uh, competitor material, mercury telluride, cadmium telluride. It's exactly the same story. The only thing is if you, if you compare the two, the conduction, the valence band here is overlapping the conduct. The well of the valence band is overlapping the well of the conduction band, whereas in this uh, type two super lattice, it's shifted by half a period. What that means is when we put elect when we have one of these super lattices where, the, the, where where we switch the order, and we're interested in, uh, or an important parameter will be the electron hole hybridization. Because of the separation of the, of the quantum wells, the overlap of electron and hole wave functions is much weaker in the type 2 superlattice compared with the mercury telluride, cadmium telluride type 1 superlattice. And that's something to remember because this one is the one that's been studied most, the mercury telluride, cadmium telluride, because it's type 1 and it has strong hybridization and it gives much simpler behavior. When you, get, when you weaken the hybridization, some funny stuff starts to happen. So I'll start with the mercury telluride, cadmium telluride. Uh, this shows actually to get to the, the true topological uh, properties, you have to put in, you have to make the cadmium telluride barriers wide enough to give you essentially multiple quantum wells with no overlap between neighboring wave, func wave functions and neighboring wells. Uh, so we basically have free motion in the plane in the x and y direction, but in the growth direction, which we'll call z, uh, there's no overlap between wave functions. So we now have two-dimensional uh, quantum well of, of, of mercury telluride with barriers of cadmium telluride. And for the, the type two situation, we put aluminum antimonide barriers uh, in order to, 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 to make us, again, a two-dimensional quantum well for electrons and holes. So that's the system we're talking about from now on. And the typical layer widths are about, uh, you have to be wider than 64 angstroms for the, uh, for the, for the two six material and wider than about 90 angstroms for the 3.5 material. So uh, the, the, the things started to happen around 2006 when Bernavig, Hughes, and Zhang published this uh, uh, science paper, which was quite uh, uh, a seminal work, where they showed if you took one of these mercury telluride telluride quantum wells and you made it about 62 uh, angst uh, angstroms wide, the, the band structure would essentially look like these two cones, rather like you see in graphene. 
Uh, and when you make it wider, that you get this inversion. What was an electron-like band would go into become would become the valence part of the band structure, and what was a hole-like band wh when we were narrow becomes the conduction part of the band structure. And because it's two-dimensional, you get this band gaps in the two cases and a point at the phase transition. So we'll talk about what happens in this inverted uh, case, which is the topological insulator phase. But first, let's talk about the phase transition, because this is a little simplified. They made a, a 4 by 4 K dot P model, which showed that you've got this graphene-like band structure. But when you go to an 8 by 8 K dot P model, and you put in the effect of the interfaces, which is a calculation I performed using our model, you can see that actually this graphene uh, band structure is split. Uh, and the splitting in this model is entirely due to the interfaces, the fact that the, in, the, the bonds of the interfaces are not inversion symmetric. Uh, along one interface, the chains of atoms go along 110, and on the other interface, they go along bar 110. Uh, and, and that causes a, uh, a splitting uh, which, you, which is shown here. Actually, this is uh, drawn by a Russian group who came out with a similar result just shortly afterwards. Uh, but you can see, in order to get, in order to satisfy the Kramer's degeneracy, which says that when you reverse time, you have to. You, there's always another state at the, the time rever at, when you reverse time. Uh, when you reverse time, you reverse the, the wave vector, which, let's say, we're over here, will come over here. But you also reverse the spin. So the spin has to follow tangentially around the Fermi circle. And so you get this kind of vortex-like structure that we saw at the beginning in the Nobel uh, di Prize diagram. Um, where this model doesn't include another type of asymmetry called bulk inversion asymmetry. But when you include that, that also gives you a soul smitting. And the two actually act together. Uh, and, and you, but, but, but the result is lo looks like this. So, so we've got this inverted. When we go. So, so we have a, a layer thickness here of 64 angstroms of mercury telluride. When we go to, let's, to about 75, we get a situation where the band gap opens to about 20 millivolts. And now the S symmetry band is, 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 is the valence band, and the P symmetry band is the conduction band. And lo and behold, what happens is that you, you have a, an insulator because there's a band gap, but the edges now conduct, and, and, and the topological uh, uh, insulator part is that you get these edge states which are, whose direction of motion is locked to their spin. So the blue shows a state which is going in the negative x direction, which is spin up. There's no spin down equivalent. The spin down is going in the other direction. And so you get these two helical edge states. The spin up travels clockwise, and the spin down travels anticlockwise, and the bulk is an insulator. And that's a topological insulator. So where do these come from? So I'm going to try and give, I hope I'll succeed, the simplest explanation of, 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 of of, of, of what, what's going on topologically. So to do that, the easiest thing to do is just to review quickly the Dirac Hamilton, this, the Hamiltonian for an electron and a positron, which is a 4 by 4 matrix uh, with diagonal elements which are mc squared. If, oh, actually, that, we can so first of all separate it up into, into two by twos. For spin up, in the, for electron positron with spin up in the top two by two block, and electron and positron spin down for the bottom two by two block. So if, uh, the diagonals are the mass terms, and the off-diagonals are the momentum terms. And when you find the eigenvalues of one of these 2 by 2 matrices, you find it's just the uh, Einstein uh, result. E is P squared, oh, this should be E squared, is P squared C squared plus M squared C to the 4. Uh, so, uh, and when M goes to 0, you get the, a photon. The energy just goes as plus or minus PC, and that's basically the equation that describes a photon. Well, when you do the K dot P model in its simplest form, you get exactly the same kind of equation. You get a, a two by two block for an electron and a hole spin up, and a two by two block for an electron and a hole spin down. That's the Hamiltonian you'll find in this paper by Bernavig that came out in 2006 in Science. Uh, so again, this should be E squared P squared. It's, E squared, it's the same equation, but it should be E squared. But we can make a trans but, but basically, we'd get the same answer here if we make the trans transformations where P is equal to H cross K, C is equal to A over H, and MC squared is M. So the K dot P, P Hamilton is the same. We just uh, transfer the constants to new constants. So let's work now with the K dot P Hamiltonian. Uh, and we have now a material shown in gray, which obeys this K dot P Hamiltonian, where, and we'll make M negative. And because that's the topological insulator, 
uh, case. Remember that the, the, if we go back one step, the uh, top left-hand corner is for electrons, and the next along the diagonal is for holes. So when S is above P, M is positive. But when S is below P, M is negative. So the topological insulator phase has a negative M uh, with S below P. And as we pass to the outside, we get to a, a kind of, you could say, a Dirac Hamiltonian, where the, where the mass is essentially infinite, uh, where the M is, is, is positive and very, very large. And at some point, the electron has had, the, the, the M value has to pass through zero. And when it passes through zero, uh, you get this uh, very, very simple solution, which is just E is uh, plus or minus PC, or plus or minus AK in this notation. Uh, so where do we put the, uh, we have two solutions and two surfaces. So one belongs to one edge, and one belongs to the other edge. I can't tell you which is which unless you look at the actual wave function, and we don't have time for that. But it turns out that the, uh, the, the minus AK belongs to the left-hand edge, and the plus AK belongs to the right-hand edge. And then we solve the bottom 2 by 2 Hamiltonian, and we get uh, exactly the same result. But this time, we know uh, that we have to put them on the, uh, uh, the opposite way around. If spin up was on the left-hand edge, spin, that, spin down also goes on the left-hand edge, because now we, solve, we, satisfy, we have to satisfy the Kramer's degeneracy. When I reverse time, I reverse momentum and spin. And so I get these uh, uh, linear-like dispersions uh, which correspond to my helical states. What, what goes to the left on the left hand, uh, negative x on the left-hand side goes positive x on the right-hand side. That's the helical state going around with spin-up. Uh, and the other thing is that these, these states are often called time reversal protected because you can't open up a band gap at zero uh, at, at the Brillouin zone center. Uh, because you have to satisfy the Kramer's degeneracy, the moment you open an upper band gap, you, you cannot satisfy to k equals naught. So these are called time reversal protected. They're also very hard to scatter because when you, if, you, if you try to scatter the, the electron in the, left, in the clockwise helix with spin up into uh, the, the, the state going alongside with spin down, you have to reverse the spin in order to reverse its direction, and that's very hard to do. So they're essentially dissipationless. They can travel through quite long uh, coherence lengths before being scattered. So because of this robustness, when, when they cross, you get, uh, it's very hard to disturb them, and so we get these uh, essentially massless uh, Dirac fermions that, that travel along the edges. So what about the weak case? This is the case of weak uh, hybridization is a bit different. What, what, what I'm showing here is we're in the we, we're kind of building a topological insulator by first of all putting the s the in plane this shows the in plane dispersion for the for the s states, where their band edge is below the in plane dispersion for the p states, and now we turn on electron hole hybridization. But it's in the in the mercury telluride cadmium telluride it's so it's case it's so strong that we just get normal looking bands. The S repels all the P and we just get a normal band structure with the band gap at zero. Here it's not strong enough and so we get small band gaps that open up, open up indirectly away from the zone center. And in fact, when you do the, K dot, the full K dot P calculation, you find you can't get above about five millivolts for this. It's, it's kind of smaller than the, the first case of the, of the mercury telluride, cadmium telluride. Nevertheless, when you uh, uh, well, then when you do the full band structure calculation, there's another complication, and that's the, the, the band split because uh, of structural inversion asymmetry. Because it's type 2, and the uh, electrons and the holes are not in the same layer, it causes a large splitting. Uh, and finally, uh, you put in the edge states, uh, and, and, and they kind of go to where the band edge was before it split. So you, get, you do get edge states. And uh, the, the, they merge with the band edges just like for the, uh, for the, for the first case, but, but they kind of uh, fade into the bulk states wh when you go below the crossing point. But nevertheless, you have these topological, you have these uh, uh, helical uh, uh, structure. So, so what about the wave functions? When we calculate the wave functions, uh, these are calculated with, with using something called standard boundary conditions. I'll talk a bit about, more about that in a moment. But you, you get basically a wave function using standard boundary conditions of the edge, which for, this, for the 2, 6 material decays uh, just simply exponentially away from the edge over a distance of about 1,000 angstroms. For the, for, the, for the other material with weak hybridization, it actually decays more strongly and it has oscillations. 
Uh, and that's a first difference between these two, uh, the strongly and weakly hybridized states. But nevertheless, they kind of have something in common with other kinds of edge states that you can find in physics. Here are two examples. One is surface plasmons and another is surface phonons. In all cases, you get a maximum amplitude at the edge which decays away into the material. So in this case, you can think of it as looking rather similar, but when you move it to the left, you're going out of the sample and into the vacuum. So essentially it decays, but it decays with an infinite decay uh, constant. So it decays to, uh, to zero over zero distance. So it's like the decay, the exponential decay constant goes to infinity. So I believe this is the more correct description. Uh, the wave function I'm showing you actually shows the, uh, the, uh, how it looks at k equals zero. As you increase the wave vector away from zero, what happens is the decay length increases more and more and more until when you merge with the bands, it's gone, the decay length has gone to infinity and it becomes like a bulk extended state. So that's all nice, well-behaved physics. But if you look in the literature, this is the kind of wave function you'll find in most papers. It actually has zero amplitude at the edge. It peaks at about 100 angstroms, and then it decays. And this is because it's, it's calculated with a different set of boundary conditions to the ones that I use to calculate these. They're called open boundary conditions. And the argument here is that because we have a quadratic equation, the, the, the k dot p Hamiltonian is quadratic in k, so it gives two solutions for each spin. And if you have two solutions, you can, they're actually both exponential. It's very easy to subtract them or, uh, in the right amounts to make the wave function go to zero where the potential goes to infinity. It's all mathematically correct and physically uh, seemingly correct. The problem is that the two solutions you get out of the k dot p Hamiltonian, one of them is spurious. There's quite a lot of literature. Oh, what happened now? Okay. Well, there's quite a lot of literature about these k dot p Hamiltonians because they're made with a very small basis set, in this case, just electrons and holes. Uh, that the, the, they have to yield two solutions, but one of them is not physically correct. The, the, they're often called the wing, wing solutions or spurious solutions. Uh, and they don't, they're just there to satisfy boundary conditions, but they don't physically exist. And, and hints that this is what's going on here is that when you look at some of the uh, properties of the edge states, this, here's an example calculated for reasonable parameters, they don't merge uh, very nicely with the band edges the same way that this one does. And, and there, in fact, for the parameters I use here, you, this one actually has no solutions because one of the two, two solutions that they combine here switches from exponential to oscillatory, uh, whereas this still can be solved. So uh, the boundary condition, the, mo most, of, most results in the literature are actually based on this method, but, but it's actually combining a physical and spurious wave function, and so it leads to some spurious results. So it's something to watch out for and be a little beware of. So, uh, just some, some uh, well-known uh, properties of topological insulators. Uh, you could take one of these uh, samples with the helical states and put contacts at the end. And then if we pass the current from the positive electrode in front to the negative electron beh electrode behind, it can only travel in a spin-up state on the left and a spin-down state on the right. This is a diagram I've taken from one of uh, Mollenkamp's uh, presentations, their group in Würzburg that works very widely on these materials. Uh, and so what happens is that the uh, spin-ups are all separated to the left and the spin-downs to the right. And this is called the quantum spin-hall effect. There's no magnetic field, but it, in, in the Hall effect, you separate positive charges and negative charges to opposite sides of the sample. Here, you're separating up spins and down spins to opposite sides of the sample. So it's called the quantum spin-hall effect. Now, it's been measured for the first time by Koenig and co-workers from the Würzburg group in 2007 uh, using a hull bar. And, and one thing I didn't mention is that these one-dimensional states that travel along the edge, we have a two-dimensional quantum well, and these edge states are one-dimensional. And you can show that a one-dimensional state has a quantum quantized conductance of E squared over H. So we have two edges, we should get two E squared over H, and that's what was measured here. And you can see if we compare the black line and the red line, they make the, they, they, uh, make the sample uh, half as wide. So if it was bulk conduction they were looking at, uh, there would be a change in conductance, but there's no change, which means they're just looking at the edge states because the sample still has two edges, each which is giving E squared over H. So this is the first proof that we're looking at edge states. Uh, and uh, it also shows that the coherence lengths must be at least one micron because the length of the sample is one micron. 
And, and, and it also shows that they persist, in this case, up to four, at least four Kelvin. This is the similar result uh, that came out for the, t uh, for the group three material. Uh, it depends a little, uh, I don't have time to describe it, but let's stick with the Hall result, which, which has a quantized conductance of two E squared over H, just like for the two six material. If you go to a pi arrangement, it actually, you can show that it should be four E squared over H, and they show that too. Uh, and again, if, uh, the, the, this, this uh, graph shows that again, they, they persist up to five or six Kelvin before you start to lose them. So uh, uh, the, 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 the quantized conductance and edge-like behavior has been shown. So finally, what happens when you, I've now taken the, the, the edge states I showed for a semi-infinite sample with spin up and spin down, and I'm just showing the blue spin up, which is a state going to the left on one edge. If I now put in the other edge, it would be uh, traveling in the other direction, so it would be uh, the, the other opposite slope, and that's shown by now by these dashed lines. And if we now uh, make the sample narrower, the, 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 where they cross, they can actually interact and form a band gap. And so what happens is if you start with a, a, a low energy, the state behave, belongs to this uh, negative going uh, 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 slope, a negative, uh, the state that travels, edge state that travels in the negative x direction, which is the left-hand side. You go to the, where the band gap forms, and the, st the states now belong to both edges, and then you go to the uh, higher in energy, and you switch to the positive going state, which is on the right-hand side. So just to show you, uh, finally, uh, th these are results calculated with the open boundary conditions with mercury telluride, cadmium telluride. If we go to this, uh, this shows the splitting as a function of the sample width. And this just shows you that when we change the boundary conditions to the standard boundary conditions, which I believe are more correct, the, the, the band gap is considerably smaller. So all the results in these topological insulators depend very much on the boundary conditions used at the edges. So if there's one message anybody's interested in topological insulators takes home today, it's that you should be careful of the boundary conditions at the edges if you really want to describe the, the, the wave function properly. And then here are results for the type three, which are even smaller from the, I'm sorry, for the three five, which are even smaller by about an order of magnitude than the two six. So to conclude, uh, narrow gap super lattices make good infrared detectors. Uh, this PBP barrier architecture gives dark current and quantum efficiency close to state of the art, which is this rule 07. So that's why we're, we, we're, we're, we're making them. Uh, but these super lattices, narrow gap super lattices also make good topological insulators. Why? Because they're made from large atoms with large Z numbers, and that means they have a large uh, uh, spin orbit interaction. Uh, and and they can, because the gaps are narrow, we can get this inverted band structure, the two conditions for a topological insulator. Uh, so we can have them in two six materials and three five materials. Uh, the difference is the strength of the electron hole hybridization. And the edge dispersions depend very much on the boundary conditions. And I, I, I think the open boundary conditions are easy to solve, but they exhibit unphysical behavior. Uh, the direction of motion depends on spin. The transport is dissipationless. It exists up to about 5K in these materials. Uh, the quantum spin hall effect is separate spin. So Monday that might be used as a way to uh, separate spins in spintronic devices, but it'll work at helium temperatures and the edge state conductance is quantized, and if you make the samples narrow, you'll get tunneling, which will reverse the direction of motion since the spin, if the spin doesn't change. Thank you.